Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started this morning by welcoming all of you guys. Sawadee Kaap, welcome to Watsung Yu. Nice to see all of you guys this morning. Welcome to all of you guys that are here, as well as those of you guys that are joining online. Today is the third day of a retreat that we've been having here, but I know some of you guys are just coming maybe for this morning because of our normal classes of Sunday, Wednesday, and Saturday. And you're more than welcome to be here for that amount of time that you had planned to be here. And if you're interested in staying longer throughout the rest of the retreat or the rest of today, you're more than welcome to do that as well. What we're doing is I'm sharing teachings with students of how to get to the first stage of enlightenment. The Buddha taught the path to enlightenment, how to train your mind to get to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, where you're no longer experiencing any discontent feelings. By the time you get to enlightenment, you no longer experience anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, stress, anxiety, even the slightest displeasure is eliminated from the the enlightened mind. You're always in a good mood by the time you get to enlightenment. The Buddha discovered certain pollutions that are in the mind that are hindering you from being able to experience this type of mental state. And when you train in your mind and you uproot these pollutions out of your mind, you can get to a point where your mind's always peaceful and always joyful. And this is, comes through gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. So over the five-day retreat, I'm sharing with students how to get to the first stage of enlightenment. There's four individual stages. And this morning, what we're going to be doing is I'm sharing with you guys how to do loving kindness meditation. What loving kindness meditation is, is it's a meditation to help you uproot the anger, the hatred, the ill will, the frustration, the irritation, the annoyance. By the time you get to enlightenment, you don't even have the slightest dislike towards another being. Where right now, there's probably people that you like, and there's probably people that you don't like. And this is just because of certain pollutions that are in the mind. And when you can uproot these through gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress, you can get to the point where you're no longer judging people or looking down on people or thinking of people in negative ways, you can get to a point where you just have love and kindness for all beings. So if this is something that you're interested in learning, you can learn here at your time in Chiang Mai and you can learn with us online as well because I live stream the various classes and retreats that we have. So welcome to all of you guys again. Welcome to everyone online. As we get started, I would like to just check in with those of you guys that know about the excursion that we're doing today because I need to organize transportation. We're planning to go to an orphanage today at 1.30. We're going to be leaving from here. We're going to be taking some supplies to help the orphanage and I need to organize vans. So I took a count yesterday, but there's other people that have come to me and shared that they would like to go as well. So I'd like to just get a final count. So those of you guys that are going, can you just raise your hand? Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, this is actually good because the price is a little bit higher for the van because it's high season. So I shared with you guys a certain price for yesterday and it looks like it was going to exceed that. But with more people, it actually keeps the price. I think what I had quoted you guys yesterday. Yeah, it's going to keep the price to what we said yesterday. So this is perfect. All right. I'm glad I checked in with you guys. So we'll talk about going to the orphanage when we get to the lunch break at 1230. And I'll let you guys know how we're going to do that. But in the meantime, I have this content to share with you guys about loving kindness meditation. I'm going to teach you guys how to do loving kindness meditation in the seated position. And I'm just going to switch over to some visual aids here online so the folks can join us from online. Okay. So 
as I've been teaching in the retreat, there's these four meditations that the Buddha taught. And these meditations are developing the mind to eliminate certain unwholesome qualities and cultivate certain wholesome qualities. And so far, you've learned breathing mindfulness meditation, and you've also learned walking meditation, which walking meditation is just breathing mindfulness meditation in a different position done a slightly different way. So the goals of that meditation are to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, which is the cause of discontent feelings and to arise the wholesome quality of mindfulness or awareness of mind and concentration, which is singleness of mind. But now we're going to move into loving kindness meditation, which addresses that second poison or that second unwholesome root that we talked about when we talked about the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots. That's the anger, the hatred, the ill will, and those lesser versions like frustration, irritation, annoyance, and things like this. So we're going to be cultivating this loving kindness or this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well while we're eliminating anger, hatred, and ill will. And this gradually gets worn away. It's not like you meditate once and well, wham, you know, your anger is gone. It takes this gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. One of the biggest myths about the life story of the Buddha is some people think that he sat under a tree, he meditated, and he instantly got to enlightenment, but this isn't actually true. He had gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. And you know this to be true because everything you've ever done in your life has been the same way, whether it's learning to read, write, and speak English or any kind of job or occupation that you have. It's been gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress that you've been experiencing progress in your life. And it's the same thing with this journey to enlightenment. You need to build and develop this life practice where you're able to train your mind and gradually move it towards this enlightened mental state. So everything in the teachings of the Buddha, there isn't anything that you should ever believe. The teachings of the Buddha aren't about believing a bunch of things and then hoping something good happens when you die. It's also not rules or commandments. The Buddha didn't use guilt, shame, or fear in order to motivate people to learn his teachings. He already attained this peaceful mental state where his mind was peaceful and joyful. And then he just shared with people what he did in order to get to this peaceful and joyful mental state. So you can't believe your way to enlightenment and you can't meditate your way to enlightenment, but you wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment without meditation either. So we use meditation as a way to train the mind to get to this enlightened mental state where it can be peaceful and joyful for the rest of your life. So I'm going to share with you guys the teachings on loving kindness meditation to be able to help you to understand what it is and how to do it. And then we're going to actually do it together. So first, let's talk about what loving kindness is. is some people refer to this as metta. If you study the Pali language, this is the original language that the teachings of the Buddha are in. There's 45 large volumes about this thick. That's about 10 centimeters or five inches thick. And these 45 books they're in Pali, they're in the Pali language, but now we've translated them over to English so that that way the international community can learn and understand these teachings and get the benefits and the results of understanding the teachings of the Buddha and training your mind. So you might see some people refer to this as metta. I use the English word because that way you don't need to learn the Pali language. I teach everything in English. There's only two words that I still use that are in the Pali language, and that's only because they don't translate to English words. So loving kindness is this active goodwill towards all beings without judgment, a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. And this is without judging. This is without expectations. This is without wanting somebody to be a certain way, because that's oftentimes what's hindering you from being able to practice loving kindness with all beings is you might have certain expectations of people. You're wanting people to be a certain way. And when they're not that way, you might think that you dislike them or you don't want to associate with them because maybe they do things differently than you. But if you understand the universal truth of impermanence, which is a core fundamental teaching of the Buddha that I introduce students to when they first get started, you'll understand that people can't do things the same way as you. Everybody's going to do things differently because we've had different experiences. But when an individual has craving, desire, attachment, this longing, yearning, this wanting, these expectations in the mind, you might want people to be a certain way and feel like you can only love them when they do those things. This is sometimes referred to as conditional love, even though there's no such thing as conditional love. What this is, is if you meet my expectations, I will say I love you. But if you stop meeting my expectations, I don't love you anymore. You might have experienced this in your various relationships where as you are meeting people, as you are coming in contact with people, as you are having boyfriends or girlfriends, you might have spent time with somebody and you got to a point where you ultimately said, I love you. 
right? And then they said, oh, I love you too, right? Or something like this. And then as you went through life for however long, whether it's six months, a year, two years, you eventually got to a point where you said, I don't love you anymore. We need to break up. We need to end our relationship. I don't feel the passion like I once did. Well, this isn't actually love. This is craving, desire, attachment, masquerading as love. The mind in the unenlightened state doesn't really understand love 100%. So what it does is it has certain expectations, certain wants. And essentially what the unenlightened mind says is, I love you. Therefore, I want you to be with me because you make me happy. But this isn't actual love. This is, I want something from you. I want you to make me happy. But that happiness is only temporary because the mind can only be happy as long as this person is doing the things you want them to do. As soon as they stop doing the things you want them to do, this is where you might say, I don't love you anymore. So in order to get to pure love or true love, this loving kindness, you need to get to a point where you just love an individual as they are. So just love beings as they are, understanding that People aren't going to do things your way. Oftentimes we have expectations of our parents, of our siblings, of our life partners, of our children. And as long as they meet your expectations, you might be happy. But as soon as they stop doing things your way, you might be sad or frustrated or agitated or annoyed or feeling like they're disrespecting you or something of this nature. But the reason why they're doing things differently is because not everybody in the world can do things exactly the same way. We've all had different experiences in life, so we're going to make decisions differently. But as long as the mind's wanting or craving or expecting people to be a certain way, when they're not that way, you'll be frustrated and agitated. And even if they do things the way you want them to do, you'll only be happy temporarily. That happiness will arise, it'll change, and it'll fade away because it's conditional happiness. It's based on some condition that if you do things my way, I will be happy. But because this person can't do things your way all the time, then that means eventually the mind's going to end up in the sadness, the frustration, agitation, or annoyance. And you might think that those feelings that are painful for you to experience, that this person outside of you or this situation is causing those painful feelings. So when you experience anger and sadness and frustration, you might push somebody away thinking that that's going to solve your problem. This is called aversion, where you push the person or you push the situation away. And this doesn't solve the problem because you just get agitated or annoyed about something else. It's only a matter of time. If this was the real problem, when you push your friends or your family members members or coworkers away, then you would be peaceful from that point forward. You would never experience anger or frustration ever again, but that's not the real problem. It's not external. And then what will also happen if you experience painful feelings like anger, sadness, and frustration, you might be bitter and hostile and have animosity towards others through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. And now this damages your relationships when you're being harsh with other people. Or the third thing you might do is you might put your expectations on people, trying to control people to do things your way, thinking that if I can just get my desires fulfilled, if I can just get people to do things my way, this world would be perfect. But this is coming from one's mind that has craving, desire, attachment, this longing, yearning. And it's also coming from the ego too. Oftentimes the unenlightened mind has the ego there that is telling it that everything you're doing is so great and everything everyone else is doing is all wrong. And what the mind sometimes tends to do is go around and try to convince other people to do things your way. So you can eradicate all of this from the mind by practicing loving kindness meditation and cultivating this loving kindness in the mind. Essentially what you're doing is you're rewiring the mind. Right now, if you think that other people are causing you to be angry, when somebody does something that you disagree with, you might go down this well-worn path of anger and you've got the bushes pushed back, you've got the stickers pushed back, the branches are maybe cut off and this is a well-worn path that the mind goes down this anger. And we know where that ends. It ends in broken relationships. But what you're looking to do by practicing something like loving kindness meditation is rewire the mind that you don't have this anger, that when somebody does something you disagree with, that you can understand that that's a decision that they made and you can disagree with the decision while still loving the person. This is really key, that you can love the person while disagreeing with the decision because people are going to make decisions differently than you. There's only one person in the world that's going to make decisions 100% the way you agree with. Do you know who that is? 
yourself, right? That's the only person that you're ever going to agree with 100% of the time. So if you got angry every time you disagreed with somebody, then you're just going to damage your relationships over and over and over. And the number of people you can spend time with is going to become fewer and fewer and fewer. So by training your mind and essentially rewiring it to no longer experience anger, now you can live harmoniously with all beings around you. So it starts with understanding what loving kindness is, which is this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. What you're doing here is instead of going down this path of anger, you're going down this new path. You're trying to get out your machete and clear out the bushes and the stickers and the branches and create this new path where you can be loving and kind with all beings. But this is going to be challenging because your mind doesn't naturally go down that path because it hasn't been trained to do that. It's more natural to go down this path of anger and hostility and bitterness and animosity. So you can rewire the mind in meditation gradually over time to start going down this new path. And then as you go down this new path more and more, it gets easier and easier for you because it becomes more and more comfortable. It becomes more and more natural. So this loving kindness is the antidote or the wholesome root, and it remedies anger, hatred, and ill will. It eliminates this harshness and bitterness, this hostility, this resentment in the mind. If you have negative self-talk in your mind or you diminish yourself, this meditation will help you with that too. Because as long as you've got that little voice in there telling you diminishing things and degrading things about yourself, that's going to be very hard for you to get to a peaceful and joyful mental state that is permanent. So by the time you train your mind and you uproot the anger, hatred, ill will towards other beings, you will also have uprooted it towards yourself too. So if you've got any kind of negative self-talk or some inner dialogue where you diminish yourself regularly, you can actually eliminate that and liberate the mind. You don't need to hold on to the anger. Sometimes we hold on to anger in the unenlightened state in this resentfulness because we think we're getting back at that person who harmed us. If somebody harmed you, you might feel like you're going to hold on to your anger in order to get back at them. But this is essentially like trying to burn somebody by holding on to a hot coal. If you're holding on to a hot coal in your hand, the only person that's getting burned is you. Right. So as long as you hold on to the anger and the resentment in the mind, then you're only hurting yourself. You're not hurting anybody else. But then when that anger arises through your intentions, your speech and your actions, now you're hurting others and you're damaging your relationship. So by transforming the mind and, and cultivating this loving kindness, you can be more loving and kind to the beings around you. This is also part of what we call the Brahma Viharas. These are four healthy mental states that an individual needs to cultivate on their way to enlightenment. This is loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. These are antidotes to specific challenges in the mind that you learn as part of your journey to enlightenment. And loving kindness is one of those Brahma Viharas or healthy mental states that are cultivated. I'd like to share with you some of the words of the Buddha where you can see loving kindness plugs into his core central teaching because I've been teaching in this retreat a teaching called the Eightfold Path. This is the core central teaching of the Buddha. And these are some of the words of the Buddha that I've extracted out of that just to show you guys that are familiar with the Eightfold Path that you've maybe studied with me using the words of the Buddha. I've shared with you how the Eightfold Path is a core central teaching and all the other teachings plug into it. Well, here is where you can see loving kindness plugs in to the Eightfold Path. When we studied right intention, remember there's three aspects to right intention. This is the right thinking or the right thought, cultivating certain thoughts in the mind to then prepare you to practice the rest of the path to get to enlightenment. The Buddha talks about the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of harmlessness. That non-ill will, that's a double negative. So non-ill will is the same as good will, right? And that harmlessness, that's what's going to help you to practice that harmlessness is having the loving kindness or the good will in the mind. So this is where loving kindness plugs into that. And then if you remember the five factors of well-spoken speech, the fifth factor is to speak with a mind of loving kindness, right? If you can speak with a mind of loving kindness, then whatever you're saying is going to come out and be more loving and more kind. And remember, there's those five factors, speaking at the right time, what you say is true, is gentle, is beneficial, and with a mind of loving kindness. And this is going to help produce the best results for you that when you're making wise decisions to interact with people in this way, then you'll experience wholesome results. Right now, you might think that you speak to people in the most loving and kind way, but if you haven't studied the natural laws that the Buddha teaches, then you most likely aren't speaking in a way that is 
based on these natural laws. And one of the factors that he teaches you is this loving kindness is to speak with a mind of loving kindness. Because if you speak with the opposite of that, which is a mind of inner hate, now when that hate comes out through your speech, it's just going to come back to you. When you're aggressive and hostile and argumentative and bitter with others, that just is going to come back to you. So if you're looking to create a peaceful and joyful mind and a peaceful and joyful life, you're going to need to do this inner work to improve your wisdom and then improve the way that you interact in the world. And one of the things that the Buddha teaches us is about speech and understanding this natural law of cause and effect or action and result. It's referred to as the natural law of gamma, or some people call it karma. Karma is the Sanskrit version of this word, where gamma is the Pali version. This is cause and effect or action and result. It's the results of your decisions. It's not mystical or magical. It's not punishments and rewards. There's no being that's overseeing this natural law and deciding who gets punished and rewarded. It's not anything mystical or magical. It's not even about who's at fault or who's to blame. It's just about a sequence of events. That there's a certain action that is going to produce a certain result. And there's a certain cause that's going to produce a certain effect. So when you make wise decisions based on the natural law of gamma, you'll experience wholesome results. But when you make unwise decisions, it's going to produce unwholesome results. So one of the things that the mind in the unenlightened state has a lack of wisdom of is the natural laws of existence around speech. And oftentimes in the unenlightened state, an individual is speaking in a way that is unwise. And then when you're putting that out, then there's this harshness and bitterness that comes back to you and you might be confused why. And you might blame other people for what they're saying to you or what they're doing. Well, maybe they're making unwise decision to speak with you in unwise ways ways, but oftentimes what you'll notice is that you've been doing things and saying things that were unwise that precipitated these events to occur. So in the teachings of the Buddha, you're taking responsibility and accountability for your own decisions and then making sure that you make wise decisions that produce wholesome results. And one of those wise decisions is to speak with a mind of loving kindness. But how could you do that if you didn't have a tool or a technique to cultivate this loving kindness? So loving kindness meditation is there to help you cultivate this and build up the loving kindness in the mind. It's almost like filling up the gas tank of your car and then you can drive your car really far. It's the same kind of thing that if you fill up your mind with loving kindness and you have the mind permeating and filled with loving kindness, then you can go out in the world and you'll find that you can have intentions and speech and actions that are more loving and kind with others. But if you're not attending to the mind and you're not training the mind, then you might not have brought loving kindness to full development and full perfection in the mind. There might be some people that you love and you're kind to, and there's other people that you hate. And that means that your hate's coming up and it's going out into the world and it's going to come back to you. But what would you would like to do is permeate the mind with loving kindness so that in all your relationships, you can be loving and kind and that you have no room in your life for a negative or a harsh relationship or argumentative speech or harsh speech or anything like this. So this is where it plugs into the Eightfold Path, but it even plugs into the Eightfold Path with right action. For those of you guys that studied right action yesterday, you saw where the Buddha was talking about killing and stealing and sexual misconduct conduct and things like this, that's all to help you eliminate anger and hatred and ill will as well. Here, the Buddha is actually talking to his students, to the monks. And prior to this last one that I have here, he's actually talking about the five factors of well-spoken speech. He's sharing with his students that he advises them to speak at the right time, what they say is true, speak gentle, speak beneficially, and speak with a mind of loving kindness. But then he reminds them that even though I'm advising you to speak that way, he advises them that other people are going to speak to you in an untimely way, in an untruthful way. They're going to speak to you harshly. They're going to speak to you unbeneficially. And they're going to speak to you with a mind of inner hate and anger. And now he gets to this. He says, okay, when people speak to you in those unwise ways, he says, herein, monks, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. We shall reside compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. We shall reside enveloping that person with a mind filled with loving kindness. And starting with him, we shall reside enveloping the all-encompassing world with a mind filled with loving kindness, abundant, joyful, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train monks.
So here he's saying to train your mind to be unaffected by the way others speak. Because prior to this, he was talking about how other people speak. And this comes with training. Right now, you probably can't do that. If someone is impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful to you, you're probably the same way back with them. But this is really unwise because as long as you're putting that out, that's going to come back to you. By the time you fully train your mind, you can be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful to everybody and anybody in the world. Even if they're talking to you in unwise ways, you can still be loving and kind to them. You still might not choose to associate with this person. You still might choose to move on in the relationship, but you will know through the natural law of gamma that it's unwise to be bitter and harsh and hostile and have animosity and resentment towards others because all of that is just going to come back to you. So you can transform the mind here with loving kindness meditation and the way the buddha is suggesting to do this is through enveloping the all-encompassing world with this mind filled with loving kindness and having compassion for others here's some more words from the buddha on loving kindness meditation here he's talking specifically about meditation here this first one he's talking to his son a lot of people think that he left his family and he never came back but he actually did come back to his family after six years and his son ends up ordaining with him his wife his stepmother because his mother died when he was born and other family members and these people were getting to enlightenment they knew that they were getting to enlightenment because they could see the condition of their mind improving so here he's talking to his son he says rahula Develop meditation on loving kindness, for when you develop meditation on loving kindness, any ill will will be abandoned. This is the way a Buddhist speaks, very clear, very concise. You don't have to interpret his teachings. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to guess what he was talking about. He's teaching you the natural laws of existence that existed 2,500 years ago, but these same natural laws exist now too. So the human mind 2,500 years ago had ill will as well. And this was a tool and a technique that he shared that helped him to eliminate his ill will. And he knew that if it worked for him, it would work for you too. So he was teaching people how to practice loving kindness meditation to eliminate anger, hatred, ill will. And you can see that here in the very clear and direct teaching that he shares. And here's another one. He says, loving kindness should be developed to abandon ill will. Very clear, very straightforward, right? You don't have to interpret it. You don't have to figure it out. And I'm sharing this with you so you can have confidence that what I'm teaching you with loving kindness meditation is something that the Buddha taught because I'm not interested in you believing anything that I teach you. You can learn what I share. You can reflect on it to independently verify it and you can practice it and you can see the truth for yourself that your anger starts to come down. And eventually... It'll be six months, a year, two years. You haven't had any anger towards anyone whatsoever. And you'll know that your mind has been liberated from this anger and hatred through practicing these tools and techniques that the Buddha shares. Here's another one that the Buddha is talking about. During the lifetime of the Buddha, you might think that he was the only person teaching and that everybody was learning with him, but this isn't actually true. There was other people who were teaching. They were claiming that it was their teachings that led to enlightenment. And the Buddha knew that it was his teachings that led to enlightenment. So that's why he was very consistent, determined, had enthusiasm and motivation to share his teachings into the world. But sometimes the students of the Buddha and the students of these other teachers would get together and they would talk and they would compare notes. Just like today, you might learn with me and then you go out today and you might talk to other people about what you learned and they might share with you things that they learned from their teachers. So during this time, people were sharing with each other what they learned. So here the Buddha says to his students, suppose they ask, meaning those other people that weren't learning with him, suppose they ask, but what friends is the reason unarisen anger does not arise and arisen anger is abandoned? You should answer the liberation of mind by loving kindness for one who attends carefully to the liberation of mind by loving kindness, unarisen anger does not arise and arisen anger is abandoned. This friends is the reason unarisen anger does not arise and arisen anger is abandoned. So in your mind right now, you're probably not angry just sitting here, right? You're not experiencing anger right now. But if you've experienced anger in the past, that means your mind has what we call a mental object. It's like a deeply rooted container of ill will in the mind. And this can be triggered at any time. If somebody does something that you disagree with, perhaps that ill will will get triggered and now your mind will experience this anger. So what the Buddha is saying is this unarisen anger 
right? This unarisen anger does not arise when you're practicing loving kindness meditation. You can eliminate this. And then any anger that has arisen, you can eliminate that from the mind. Eventually, you will uproot this mental object, this deeply rooted container of ill will. You'll uproot it out of the mind and you'll never get angry ever again by the time you uproot it out of the mind. But in the process of working towards that, you're going to experience some anger along the way. So you can use this loving kindness meditation to keep the anger that is currently in the mind, keep it at bay, keep it away. And then any anger that has arisen, you can clear it out of the mind. And ultimately you can uproot the conditions that are causing this anger to arise. And that's what you're doing on the path to enlightenment is you're uprooting the pollutions of mind that are causing this anger to arise. And once you purify the mind of these causes and conditions, oftentimes referred to as pollution of mind or defilements, then your mind will no longer get angry or bitter or harsh or hostile. And this is where you'll see your personal professional relationships really blossom because you're not causing harm in your relationships any longer. So do you guys have any questions on anything that I've shared with you so far? If you guys have questions here at the temple, we have microphones here that you guys can pass around and you can keep it with you. There's a little switch on the front. You just press the gray button and then the light comes on and you hold it up to your chin and you can talk that way the people online will be able to hear you. And those of you guys that are online, if you're in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, you can put your questions in the comment section or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you like. So do you guys have any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions here, and I don't think I see any online either. Let me just check. Okay, so now I'm going to move into sharing with you how to actually do loving kindness meditation. All of that was just to help you to understand the why. Why are you doing loving kindness meditation? That's important to understand. So the way that you do loving kindness meditation is the way that I do it is I start with chanting to ease the mind into meditation. And if you would like to do the chanting, we have this on laminated sheets over there on the table. You can see that we chant in the Pali language and you'll see the English translations as well. During the lifetime of the Buddha, they did chanting as a way to commit the teachings to memory. It was kind of a learning device because they didn't write the teachings down during his life. So they needed to recite the teachings word for word for word in order to commit them to memory. And then they could actually practice them. Chanting, it's not a rite, it's not a ritual, it's not a ceremony, it's not worship, it's not prayer, anything like that. It's done in the Pali language, so oftentimes people think there's some mystical or magical thing with it, but it's not. It's just helping you to invigorate the mind and kind of create some more awareness of the mind as you ease into meditation. And it's also helping you to have awareness of breath so that that way you can get more benefit out of the meditation itself. So you guys are welcome to chant along as I do the chanting. You'll see the sheets over there and you're welcome to get up and get them at any time. Then after we do the chanting, we'll do breathing mindfulness meditation. This is where I'll guide you in focusing on the breath. And anytime the mind moves off the breath, you cut that off and bring the mind back to the breath. We'll do that for about five minutes or so, 10 minutes, just to kind of prepare the mind to then do loving kindness meditation. So I'll be kind of quiet after I give you the guidance of breathing mindfulness meditation. I'll kind of be quiet for a little bit and then I'll come back in with guidance on loving kindness meditation. What we're going to be doing in loving kindness meditation is you'll hear me saying out loud these affirmations. May I be peaceful. When you hear me say that, you just repeat it in your mind quietly. If I was doing this by myself, I would just do it quietly in the mind. But because I'm guiding you, I do it you know, so you can hear it. But what you would like to do is do it quietly in the mind on the out breath, right? And then you breathe in nice and gradual. May I be safe, right? And now you breathe in again. May I be well and may I be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. You start with I because it's very challenging to have loving kindness for others if you don't have loving kindness for yourself. This is what's going to help you get rid of that negative self-talk and that diminishing negative dialogue or that inner dialogue that you might have. So you can start with I. Then what you do is you go through these successive rings where you get wider and wider and wider. And ultimately you end with all beings where you haven't left anyone out. Here on this visual aid, I'm just showing you three affirmations, may I, we, and all beings. But you would like to customize this for yourself. If you would like to cultivate loving kindness for your mom or your dad or your brothers and sisters, you can include them in this meditation. If there's certain people that you have loving kindness for, you're going to need to maintain that, encourage that, support 
support it. Don't allow it to fade. If there's certain people that you're more neutral about, you don't really hate them, but you don't really love them either necessarily that maybe like coworkers or neighbors are kind of more neutral about them. You like to maybe include some of them in there. And then you'd ultimately like to get to some rings that are are people that you really do have anger and hatred towards. These could be people that are currently in your life, or it could be people that you will never even see again. These could be people that are already dead. If your mind is holding on to anger and hatred towards these people, your mind's not liberated from this anger, hatred, and ill will. So you'd like to go through about six to eight different rings and then ultimately getting to all beings. And you're going to hear me doing these affirmations in such a way that it applies to all of us. But when you do this, you would like to maybe say, may Barbara be peaceful, right? Or may Bob be peaceful, right? You're going to need to call individuals names that you have anger, hatred, and ill will towards so that you can rewire the mind. You're not sending them loving kindness and trying to change them. You're not wishing that they will be peaceful, safe, well, and free of discontentedness. You're cultivating your mind and rewiring it. As long as you have resentment in your mind, when you're around those people, you're going to function in that way. When I was growing up, there was a lot of things that happened in my childhood with my mom, and I carried this resentment and hostility towards her all through my life, even in my early adulthood. And in my teens and in my early 20s, there was a lot of hostility. Whenever we were around each other, it was only a matter of time before fireworks started going off. And we had these constant problems all throughout our life. But then when I started learning this loving kindness meditation, I was choosing to do something different, where in the past, my mom would pick up the rubber ball of anger and hatred, and she would throw it around the room. And then I would pick it up and I would throw it around the room and she would pick it up and throw it around the room. Next thing you know, we got all these rubber balls of anger and hatred and argumentative speech circulating around the room. But then I started doing something different, which was train my mind in loving kindness meditation. Essentially, I'm taking out this log of anger. If you think about a log jam, our relationship was jammed up and I was taking out these logs of anger and hatred and resentment and hostility so that these logs could flow. So then After I started doing this meditation, when we would be on the phone together and my mom would start being bitter and harsh and hostile, instead of being bitter and hostile and harsh right back the way I used to, I would say things like, mom, I know I've been bitter and harsh to you in the past, but I'm choosing to no longer do that anymore. I'm going to get off the phone and let you think about what it is that you just said. And we'll talk another time. I love you, mom. Right. And we'd hang up the phone. And my mom was like confused, like, hold on a second. Usually when I'm bitter and harsh and hostile, he's going to fight me right back. But I chose to do something different. And slowly but surely, I kept choosing to do something different. Sometimes it would be a month or two or three before we would talk again and give her time to think about what it is that she said. And then we would get back together and start talking again. And whenever she would be bitter and harsh and hostile, I would do the same thing as I would kind of step away and show her that I wasn't going to be angry and bitter and harsh and hostile with her. And slowly but surely, we transformed our relationship that by the time she died in 2017, there was no problems for many years in our life. We were only loving and kind to each other. But I had to do the work first. Oftentimes what we think is other people need to change first, and that's how you're going to get to peacefulness. But the way that you're going to get to peacefulness is you need to do the inner work. And that's what this meditation is helping you to do is do that inner work. So if there's people in your life that you currently have anger and hatred towards, you'll need to put them in this meditation and you might feel the anger kind of bubbling up. So after we do these affirmations, what you're going to hear me do is go back to breathing mindfulness meditation to be able to cut off and let go of any anger that might have come up as you're kind of doing this meditation. Because what I would notice sometimes when I was doing this with my mom is prior to the meditation, I was completely fine. I knew the anger was in there, but it hadn't arisen. So I would do this meditation and it would kind of trigger some memories from my childhood. And now this anger would arise that after the meditation, I would be angry. So I needed this breathing mindfulness meditation to cut that off and cut that off and cut that off. So I'm going to go back to breathing mindfulness meditation. Then I'm going to come out of the meditation with chanting. So the way that I think about it is it's kind of like a loving kindness sandwich where in the middle is the loving kindness, right? And then the lettuce and tomato is the breathing mindfulness meditation on each side. And then the bread that's holding it all together is the chanting. So I'm going to guide you guys through this. But do you guys have any questions before we actually do it together as a group? Any questions? 
Okay, so let's give it a try and give you guys a first opportunity to do this meditation. You can do this in the seated, lying, or standing positions. You can sit on the floor, you can sit on a chair. These are the three positions that we do loving kindness meditation in. If you're on the floor, you might sit with your legs cross leg, just lightly cross. You're not interested in being real tight because then it inhibits the circulation. If you're in a chair, some people like to put their feet flat on the floor, cross at the ankles. If you're on a mat, some people even like to put their legs off the mat, which gets the hips up in the air and allows the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles to be lesser so you can get more flow in your lower body. The hands and the arms, the Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and he put this into his lap. But this practice isn't about everybody doing it exactly the same way because everybody's body is a little bit different. So you might find different things that are comfortable. Some people like to put their palms on their thighs or on their knees. Some people put their palms up. So find whatever's comfortable with the lower body and the hands and arms. Your body shouldn't be painful, but it shouldn't be luxurious either. It should be in the middle where it's comfortable. The upper body should be erect. If you have your sternum up and your shoulders back, this will allow you to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose, getting a nice consistent breath. Whereas if you were slouched, the mind would have a tendency to be dull or lethargic. But if you were real rigid, the mind would have a tendency to be overactive or uptight. So you'd like the sternum to be up and the shoulders to be back to just create some erectness in the upper body so that the mind can be attentive and alert during the meditation. So I'm going to ease this into meditation with chanting. You're welcome to chant along. Or you might just decide to close the eyes and just start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. And then I'll be back with the guidance after the chanting. Arahang Samma Samoto Makewa Hoatang Makewa Nang Apiwa Teami Savakato Makewata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Makewato Savakasanko Sanghang Namami Napmoerhasaphakavato Arato Samasamputasa Nap moer hasa pakawato Arato sama samputasa Nap moer hasa pakawato Arato Sama Samputasa Iti Pisu Makawa Arahang Sama Samoto we cha charanang samuno sakato roka vitu anu tero purisa Dhamma sati satatawa manu sanang Oto pakewati Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable and the upper body erect. Just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose 
and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose. Experiencing the full breath. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. And out. (coughs) Breathing in. And out. With, With the breath well established, Start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in. And out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, Cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and 
and out. Continuing to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. Repeat these affirmations in the mind on the out breath. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes.
May mom and dad be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May my friends and family be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May all those who have caused me harm be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May all those who I have harmed be peaceful. May 
May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May all beings, wherever they reside, be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. Now go back to breathing mindfulness meditation, focusing on the breath, breathing in and out.
to slowly make your way out of meditation. I would like to apologize for the voice, a little bit sick today. Apologize for that. Um, but I think you guys were able to learn the meditation and understand how to do it. And now you've had a chance to actually practice it. So what I would encourage you to do is practice this regularly. This is really good to do in the morning because then you can go out into your day and have more loving kindness that as I share with students, I recommend that you build up to two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more of meditation. And this is something that students sometimes need six months, a year, even two years to build up to because you need to create some space in your life. There's probably some unbeneficial things that you're doing right now that if you cleared those things out, you'd probably have more time for meditation and training your mind and doing the things that's really going to help improve the mind and improve your life. And that takes time to decide to clear those things out. But as you do, if you build up to two or three sessions of meditation per day, and out of those two or three, if at least one of them is loving kindness, that would be ideal. And having loving kindness in the morning kind of sets you up really nice to go out in your day and be loving and kind with individuals that you spend time with so that you can wear away this bitterness and hostility that is in the mind and that the unenlightened mind experiences. You're not a bad person for experiencing these types of things that we talk about. You haven't necessarily done anything wrong. It's just what the unenlightened mind does every single one of us that has been born, we were born unenlightened. That's the whole reason why we were born is that we were unenlightened in our previous lives. And then now here we are in this next life with an opportunity to train our mind and be able to get to this enlightened mental state. So oftentimes when we talk about these teachings and things like this, if you notice any guilt or shame or anything like this coming into the mind, just let that stuff go. That all of us have done things that were unwise in the past and we've harmed people and people have harmed us as well. But if you're looking to get to a point where you don't experience any more harm, you don't experience any more pain and difficulties and struggles, this is the path to be able to do that. 
The teachings of the Buddha are to heal from what hurts you so that you never need to hurt ever again. I might say that again. The path to enlightenment is to heal from what hurts you so that you never need to hurt ever again. By the time you get to enlightenment, you'll never experience painful feelings ever again. And this is what you can accomplish if you stay dedicated and diligent and determined in developing your practice. And there's help for you. If you would like that help, there's books that are available at no cost. You can download them for free. You can take them and go print them. You can get printed versions here at the temple just by reimbursing us for our printing costs. Or you can get them on Amazon. If you have access to Amazon in your country, you can get them from there as well. There's videos, there's podcasts, there's classes, courses, and retreats here at the temple. And then we also offer them online as well. And there's even personal guidance and all of this stuff is available for you at no cost. So if you're done with the misery and the sadness and the grief and the despair and the anger and the hatred and all of that, and you just would like to get rid of it all, this is what will help you to do that. The teachings of the Buddha lead exactly where he said they do. I can assure you that, that you can get to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy if you decide to do that work. So if you'd like to do that work, that inner development, there's help for you to be able to do that. So I'll just see if you guys have any more questions before I end this section of our time together today. Do you guys have anything here that you guys would like to ask questions about? Sure, Junko and uh, Karen. Maybe you can pass a mic back to Karen. She's back there in the back. You can go ahead, Junko. Okay. Yeah. To start. Yep. Thank you. Um, so yesterday also, I, I wondered what uh, kind of definition or what the meaning of loving kindness meditation. And then... Today, um, so what I felt is like, um, so when I start meditation, then so, so to, to, to adjust myself, uh, to be calm or not thinking only about myself, then just focus about uh, surroundings or mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so... Do, do you think that's okay if because so sometimes uh, okay i'm going to meditate and then but uh, maybe so my mind m might not be so calm mm -hmm. but try but anyway okay i start uh but if, if my mind is not so um peaceful it's i don't think uh, it's that it's n it's not such a good start but uh if i start with this um, loving kind of meditation. So first place, so uh, may I be peaceful, and then may we be peaceful, may all be being, and so maybe I might, I'm, I might, uh, um, I might uh, put my mind um, um, be peaceful. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. So uh, I'm confused a little bit. But uh, do you think uh, my understanding is so about the loving kind of meditation? is uh, on the right track <laughs> or different <laughs> yeah if your mind is uncalm that's the reason why you would like to be meditating right because in the unenlightened state the mind goes up and down up and down at different times so you would like to get to a point where the mind is calm so if you're noticing that it's shaken up for any reason this is what you would do is meditation is part of that training but then there's other parts of the training that you've been learning as well so yeah, that's what's going to lead to the calmness. And that's why we do that breathing mindfulness meditation first to kind of get some awareness of mind, awareness of the breath, so that then the, the loving kindness can permeate in the mind more readily. Whereas if you didn't do that breathing mindfulness meditation first, and you just kind of plop down into the loving kindness, it might be more challenging for you to cultivate this loving kindness. And let me say this too, even though you didn't ask the question, is when you're, <clears throat> when you're doing this meditation, some people find it very challenging, particularly when you start including people that you do have hatred for. What we tend to do is when you have hatred towards an individual, you kind of push them aside and you erect this wall between you and them. And now because this wall is erected, it's really hard to break through that wall. You feel like it's a real struggle and you might feel those painful feelings like I did with my mom when they came up. It was really challenging, but you need to stay dedicated to it. And this is the whole reason why you would like to do a meditation like this is because it is so hard to let go of that anger and that hatred. And this is the tool and the technique that's going to help you do that. Is your mic turned off? Yeah. Okay. It must be the one in the back that's crackling. Go ahead, Karen. So I'm just curious, Dave, because I'm, I was struggling a little bit with holding the I 
in relationship to the teaching of non-self. So I'm not really sure if that was just my mind craving to understand or if this is a genuine genuine inquiry. So it's kind of twofold. Is it this a you know a craving to understand that my mind does with something that's new, but then a genuine inquiry into how to hold the eye in this meditation with the non-self. Yeah, so Karen's referencing a teaching that she's learned previously called the universal truth of non-self, which helps you to eradicate something called personal existence view. This is one of the pollutions that the Buddha discovered in the mind, where he teaches that there is no I here, there is no you, that this body nor this mind is you. Because when you cling to this body, when you're not perceived in the world the way that you want to be perceived, your self-image, then you'll feel embarrassed or you'll feel sad or frustrated or other things like this, or the mind might be holding on to a certain self-identity. So the Buddha teaches that there is no I there, right? And this is what he taught in the language that he spoke in. Well, this English language is kind of unfitting to really describe what's truly happening. If you notice right now, what I might say is this body is sick. I am not sick because there's no I here, right? But sometimes we need to use the word I in order to help people understand what we're talking about. But in your mind, even though you might be using the word I, you know that there's no I here. What some people do when they're working on realizing non-self is rather than say I, they might say, may this being be peaceful. May this being be safe. So you can do that too. That'll help you to get over the I and no longer see that as existing at all. Yes, sir. There's uh, mics here. Karen, if you could turn that one off, it seems like it's crackling. Oh, is it off? I wonder which one's crackling. We found out this week that we're so close to the police station that they use the same frequency as us on the microphones. So that's why we get the crackling every once in a while. Yes, sir. Yeah. First of all, thank you for this teaching. It's awesome. I think if everyone could do this at least a little bit, the world would become much better. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, uh, to your experience, and uh, do we actually like purify the pollutions and this contaminants from the mind, the self-grasping, the hatred, anger, or do we actually just overwrite with a new, let's say, software on top, but the seeds still remain dormant there? They're completely uprooted out of the mind. By the time you purify the mind entirely, they're completely uprooted. You're not covering them up or pushing them down or suppressing them. That's what some people think is happening, but you're actually not. You're completely uprooting it. By the time you get to enlightenment, the causes and conditions of these things that are causing the mind to experience disconsent feelings are completely eradicated from the mind. And this is why anger and frustration and all these other discontent feelings will never arise ever again because the causes and conditions that are in the mind that causes these feelings to arrive arise have been uprooted and eliminated from the mind. So that's why in a light of mind, it's physically impossible to get angry or frustrated or shy or embarrassed or any of these other discontent feelings. It's physically impossible because the causes and conditions that produce those feelings have been eradicated from the mind. Anything else you guys would like to talk about? No? Okay. Oh, you got a question? Okay. Thank you for all this mm -hmm. a lot. Um, I was wondering like the distinction between like, um, like walking of like if someone is being hostile, for example, and you like want to choose like the good way to handle the situation, mm -hmm. but like it's, um, borderline like what is like the selfish way to like turn away and what's like the selfless way to like turn away from the situation could you talk about the difference on of these two things sure so there's something called right view what right view is is maintaining the view that your mind is causing its own discontent feelings and you learn about this in the four noble truths where you can learn you can verify through independent reflection and you can practice and see that your mind is causing all these feelings itself because of craving desire attachment and this is a establishing right view where you understand that your mind is causing any feelings that you experience nobody or nothing external can cause your internal feelings it's the mind itself that is producing these so you establish right view is the very first teaching on the path to enlightenment even though some of you guys haven't learned that with me yet 
That's where I start students off is learning and establishing right view through the Four Noble Truths, where you understand and take responsibility and accountability for all the feelings in your mind and anything that's happening in your life. Because as long as we blame other people for what we're experiencing, you'll never solve your problems because it's not other people that are causing the issue. So you need to be able to establish right view. And then once you establish right view, you also need to have loving kindness and compassion for this being who you are. And you also need to have what's called protecting your contentedness. You need to be able to protect your own contentedness, your own peacefulness, where you don't allow any external things to invade your mind and and affect your contentedness in your mind. So protecting your contentedness can be potentially walking away from a situation where the example I gave you, like where my mom said what she said to me and I said, Hey mom, I'm gonna let you think about what you said. I'm going to get off the phone. I love you. You know, we'll talk another time. That was me protecting my contentedness that if I would have stayed in that conversation at that particular time, I would have potentially gotten angry and said something that I regret later. Right. So I'm protecting my contentedness and walking away from the conversation, but maintaining right view where if there are any painful feelings in your mind that you understand that you're causing those yourself, what aversion is, is where you falsely believe or you have the misunderstanding or the misperception that those painful feelings that you're experiencing is being caused by something external and that the mind thinks if I push this person away, that's going to solve my problem. So to the outside looking in, it can look the same way that you're moving on from a relationship, perhaps not the way, you know, I didn't move on from my relationship with my mom, but let's just say somebody else, say like a neighbor or a friend where they're bitter and harsh and hostile. And maybe you're bitter, harsh and hostile too, right back to them. And you decide that on your journey to enlightenment, one of the ways to clean this up is to move on from the relationship. Well, if you falsely believe that those painful feelings that you are having is caused by this person and you push them away and you erected a wall between you and them, and then you moved on, this is doing that with wrong view that you don't understand that your mind is causing your own discontent feelings and it falsely believes and has the misunderstanding that pushing this person away is going to solve the problem. And it doesn't because you'll just get angry and bitter and harsh about something else in the future. But you can choose to move on from a relationship while maintaining right view when without judging the other person either. You can see that they're bitter and harsh and hostile. Maybe you're having trouble with frustration. You're attached to them and you realize, you know what? It's just better if I move on from this relationship but you know that that's not going to solve your anger. That's not going to solve your pain that you're experiencing. You can choose to move on to give your mind space to let go of this attachment to this person, but then still continue to do the work and realizing any painful feelings you're having, you need to work on eliminating those through eliminating your craving, desire, attachment. And that might be one of the reasons why you're choosing to move on from the relationship is that you see that your mind is really attached in this situation. So on your journey to enlightenment, there are certain relationships you have right now that you might choose to move on from. Maybe you're too bitter and harsh or hostile or hateful. Maybe they're too bitter, harsh and hostile and hateful. You're not interested in doing the work. You're not committed to the relationship and maybe they're not either. And you just decide I'm going to move on from this relationship, but maintain right view that you need to do this inner work. But then there's other relationships that you're more committed to. Like I was with my mom and my wife and things like this where we had problems, but I was committed to this relationship and I was going to work those out. I was willing to do the work and they were doing the work too. And we sorted out those problems. Then there's a third category of relationships that you're going to encounter on your journey to enlightenment, which are brand new relationships that these people you may not have even met yet. And you'll only ever be loving and kind to these people. So because you're only going to ever be loving and kind to these people, that's what's going to come back to you. So these are the three categories, certain people you're going to choose to move on from and you realize that that's wise because you're not committed to the relationship. You're too bitter and harsh and hostile. You need to give your mind some space to be able to work on that. But you maintain the understanding that it's your own cravings, desires, attachments that's causing those feelings. And you just choose to move on from those relationships by just drifting off into the sunset, drift off into the horizon. You don't need to call them up and say, hey, by the way, I can't be your friend anymore. Here's all the reasons why. Because you're just listing out all your expectations and all your judgments. You're not doing this. You're not doing this. You're not doing this. You did 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 this. So the best way to move on from a relationship that isn't like a husband or wife, someone that you're living with and that you really need to have a conversation with, the best way or like a friend situation just to move on. 
just slowly stop calling them, slowly stop answering their text messages so frequently and just slowly drift off. And that way, two years from now, five years from now, when you've done some work on your mind, maybe they've done the same thing. You cross paths again. You can be friends. It's like, hey, what's up, Barbara? How you doing? I haven't seen you for a while. How's it going? Right. <clears throat> Whereas if you sit down with them and you download all the reasons why you can't be their friend. Now, when you see them in a couple of years, they're like, yeah, that's the person that said all that bad stuff to me. And no way I can be that person's friend. So you leave your options open by just slowly drifting away. So you'll let go of certain relationships, move on. And there's other relationships that you'll work on, like maybe your parents or your siblings or life partners or children or something like this. And then there's new relationships. And a lot of time you make those new relationships here in a community like this amongst a lot of loving and kind people where you can be safe to have wonderful relationships and you'll only ever be loving and kind. And then when you train your mind to be able to do that, where you're only ever loving and kind, then when you go out into the world, you can start forging relationships where you're only ever loving and kind with other people. Part of what you're doing on this path to enlightenment is you're changing your perspective about how you view the world. Sometimes we're taught that somebody that we don't know is a stranger and strangers are bad and we should avoid strangers, right? And this is like holding on to a certain perception about other people. Well, what the Buddha teaches you is that everyone that you come in contact with has previously been your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, or some other relative. So maybe when we were lizards, we were sisters, all right, brothers, or maybe you were my mom and I, you know, I was your child or something. We've been previous family members at some other point in time. And if you go out into the world thinking that way, instead of thinking about this person as a stranger, and now you need to avoid them, it's like, ah, oh, this is a family member I just haven't met yet. So here in Chiang Mai, if you speak Thai language, which you normally do when you go into a restaurant, is you talk to the food servers as your brothers and sisters or that older lady sitting behind the counter. That's your grandmother or your mom. And we literally refer to people that we've never even met as, hey, mom, I will like to have some sticky rice or whatever. So that's how we talk in Thai. So even though you might not do that where you come from, if your mind thinks that way, that when you go to a cashier, when you go to a bus and a bus driver, you taxi driver, whatever, if you think about this is my brother, this is my sister, this is my mom, this is my dad, this is my grandmother, it helps you to bring this loving kindness up in the mind and you'll be able to start treating people with more loving kindness and you'll find that it'll get easier and easier if you change your perspective and no longer look at people as strangers and you look at them as just a family member you haven't met yet. And now, hey, I can talk to this person and nothing's going to harm me. Nothing's going to hurt me. So this is how you can start forging those new relationships with people. Does that help you? Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. Now, seeing any questions online? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, because it's I'm first time here it's new, uh, and it resonates to me the speaking that all living beings at some point have been your mothers. If you look back in lives, do you have some kind of meditations on that subject or are you jumping straight into the loving kindness without like uh, steps? Because there could be like other meditations like loving all beings, like mothers, like reasonings and these kind of things which might help people to build up to. Yeah, the loving kindness meditation is what will help you build up your loving kindness. And then if you combined it with that change of perspective that you're going out into the world and thinking of everybody as brothers and sisters and moms and dads and uncles and aunts and things like this, it really changes the way you interact with people. If you have a harsh relationship with your mother and father, maybe you should think of them as your grandmother, your grandfather, like when you go out and see people or your brothers and sisters, but ultimately you'll be able to transform your relationships with your family members and you'll be able to go out into the world and think of people with this new perspective. So doing this meditation and changing your perspective about how you view others, that it's not a stranger, that it's just a family member you haven't met before. This will really help you to develop the loving kindness and do what the Buddha says is bring it to full perfection, to full growth and full perfection. If there's even one being in your life or even that's not in your life anymore, if you have hatred for them, your mind's not yet liberated. So you need to get to the point where every single being that you can have love and kindness for them, love them as they are, not wanting them to be different, not putting your expectations on them, not trying to control them, but just love people as they are. And that's also where that perspective of you can disagree with someone's decisions, but still love the person. This can really help you too. You can even get to the point where like, say somebody murdered your mom, Right now, you probably hate that person. You might be really angry if they did that. 
right? But you can actually get to the point where you understand that you disagree with their decision to have killed your mom, but you can love the person. Loving the person means you have a genuine interest in seeing them be well. Sure, this person needs to maybe go to prison. They maybe need to go to rehabilitation. They need to get some help, but you can maintain your genuine interest in seeing this being be well and get that help while disagreeing with their decision. Hating that person doesn't solve anything. It's just hindering your own mind. So by hating somebody who's done something harmful like that, it's just the mind having that hate. So you can liberate the mind from all anger, from all hatred, that even if somebody killed somebody you were close with, you could still maintain your loving kindness for them, which is a genuine interest in seeing them be well while disagreeing with their decision. And this is what will help you with these changes of perspective. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break here. It's basically 1030. I'm going to break until uh, 1045 and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about what is gamma and how does it affect me? We're going to go in and talk about this natural law directly and we'll probably end up talking about what is merit as well prior to lunch. So if you guys would like to enjoy your break and if some of you guys are leaving, I understand some of you guys might have just been here for the morning. If you'd like to come back and learn some more, you're welcome to come back and learn some more. So enjoy your break and perhaps we'll see you guys afterwards. And if not, have a lovely rest of your day. สวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับ Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.